Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, one thing about me is I, I love a good, like, underdog story. Like, all my life, I kind of felt like an underdog. And uh, until I met this man, Jesus, and he just, like, transformed my entire life, rewrote re my whole story, and just helped me to become the woman of God that he always knew I would become and who he designed me to be. Um, even in the midst of like so many people like seeing my behaviors that I was exhibiting and not understanding just the, the deep hurt and trauma that was behind his behaviors, but um, attacking my like character and attacking my, attacking my personhood, which caused me to struggle even more throughout life because I smoked weed. I, I, I had sex before marriage. You know, I was a, um, I was a, like, a teenage mother. Like, it was just so many things that, like, was just, like, according to this world that was, like, so stacked up against me. Um, and I had parents in my house. They wouldn't always display the best behaviors, but they communicated to me love in the best way that they knew how. And I can't say, like, growing up that I, I just, I didn't feel like, I didn't feel loved all the time. Sometimes, no, I didn't feel loved, but I think that's all kids, but we just, you know, we just, just knuckleheads. But, um, but yeah, so last night, I'm not even a big Sarah Jakes fan, but I was just, I, I don't know, God had just had me, like, drawn to, like, her story last night, and I was just watching as her father, like, uh, passed the torch of the women's conference to her, which was his with Woman Down Right Loose, which was a really powerful um, conference that I got to experience that was a part of my transformation story, to be totally honest, when I, my Nina Biden was a part of it. And I know people got feelings about these names that I'm naming, but I'm just telling you the impact that they had in my life and just even how I believe that, <laughs> you know, when, you know, people might not be, you know, preaching the, the right thing or their theology may be a little messed up. I, I believe that God, can, can still speak to us through these people and, and that, there's some truth in, 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 in some of the things that they said and, and, that's, and it makes me even believe more that like that word is active and alive and what he sent it out to do is gonna do and so through this through these words like these people that some of them have had like some some tragic falls in the ministry but they were a part of my transformation story I um I know bits and pieces of Sarah Jake's stories story. So when I was watching her last night, I was watching her dad like pass out a torch and witnessing that. I'm just like sitting there, I'm like, God, I'm witnessing a miracle right now. Like this is a miracle that this young black woman who was like supposed to be a statistic that grew up in this household of faith, yet and still she chose to go down a path that almost destroyed her life, but yet and still, God somewhere down her path like snatched her out of that pit and caused her to like surrender her life. And now she's, say what you want, but I know so many women who, 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 have, tra who have like transformed their lives from listening to this young woman and who love this young woman because of the message that she brings in these conferences and even when she preached, like I said, she's not my my flavor, but I, I do witness the um I witness her gift and how it transforms lives. So I was just so like just watching it like man God and then even just to watch a father, a black father, like, you know, love on his daughter and demonstrate for young black women and young black men like the importance of fatherhood. I was like, man, God, I'm witnessing a miracle once again. I look for these miracles and like, okay, God, heal this person or do these these big great works. And and I and, I, and now at 40 years old, God is opening my eyes and really allowing me to see like the miracle of everyday transformed lives. Like, man, pressure. Like, this is it. Like, this is what I want you to want you to yearn and burn for. This is what He wants His church to yearn and burn for. Like, these lives that's out here, people that's just so lost that feel hopeless, that feel like, you know, their, their lives aren't worth anything, that because of the choices and the paths that they went down, like, so, I, I don't know, it just, it just fired me up uh, when I was, you know, like I said, when I was watching it, and 
And so, I don't know, even as a mother to like young black teens, and they don't even have to be black, but I'm, as a black woman, I'm just speaking from my experience. Like just, man, like it's, it's, it's so many things like stacked up against them. And as parents, it's so hard sometimes to like keep the faith, especially when you see your kid like, girl, boy, I did not raise you to be like this, but this is the behavior you're gonna demonstrate. But last night, once again, God just reminded me like, man, Portia, stop worrying, stop worrying. Like, if you gonna believe me and you gonna trust me for their lives, believe me and trust me for their lives. You surrounded them with people who love and pour into them, even when you're not looking. And that's one thing that another miracle that I'm so grateful for, because I always pray like, God, I just want a big family. I want a family around my kids. But I never knew that he was gonna make strangers my family. And so I'm like, y'all know who y'all are in this congregation. I can't thank y'all enough. And even some of the people that's not even seeing me no more, how much you, you, you pour and help me to love my children and help my children to grow into the weird men and women of God that they will be one day. And so I'm gonna need you in the future to remind me of this day of like Portia, what he sent his word out to do, he gonna do it for all our kids, not even just my kids, but all our kids. Every kid that's a part of this ministry, and even other ministries, the, the, the church kids who want to like reject church for everything that they can, but you ain't going to be able to reject it. You can run, but you can't have. And so um, I want to read this scripture. I'm going to close out with this scripture. I hope what I'm saying is making sense because I'm so excited for like just what the God is going to do in this next generation through even my generation. Like the old folks. I want them to get some rest and let us go to work and bask in y'all prayers that y'all pray because they have not gone out void. So yes. I'm gonna read Isaiah 55. Um, I'm becoming an old fuck while I'm talking, but in no disrespect, you know, I, I think I'm grown for real, for real, because I'm 40 now. Uh, I just love saying I'm 40, like, and I'm happy with my life, and I'm, I'm, I'm just, I just never imagined being here. 40, and I, I just I just love it. But okay, I see up 55 and see it. For as the um, yeah, I'm gonna do this for Okay. So uh for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent. And so again, when I was just I was just uh, thinking on all this, I felt like this was the scripture that God brought back to me because, you know, my thoughts and my feelings should be informed by the word. Um, and so that was one of the things that he brought to encourage me even more. So if you would, just like pray with me and... Uh, Let's just keep each other, let's keep this, these kids lifted up in prayer um, because it's hard out here. Um, so please pray with me. Father God, I just lift you up this morning. I thank you for the worship that went forth, Father God, to even just begin to set the atmosphere, Lord God. Some of us came here tired and weary, Father God, from the uh, week that we have, Father God. And then some of us came here excited, Lord God. And Lord, I pray that however our affect was when we came in here, Lord God, I pray that, Lord, we will not leave here as the same individuals, God. I pray that the word, Father God, that is going to go forth, Lord God, and it's not by chance that we are sitting under this word today, Lord God, because you're going to use it, Lord, because that which you sent your word out to do is going to accomplish, Father God. So I pray that this word that goes forth to the, uh, this morning will be hidden in our heart, Lord God, and remind us, Father God, in and out of season, Lord God, when we need a right now word, God, that we we can use it, Father God, to help in the transformation, Father God, of lives, Father God. Lord, your will is that none should perish, God. And I pray that that would be our will also as believers, as followers of you, as people who profess the faith, Lord God, daily, Lord God. Give us the strength. Give us the courage, Father God. Give us the grit, Father God, to go forth in this thing that you have purposed us and called us, God. I come against, Lord God, fear, Lord God, and anything that will cause any of us to draw back, Lord God. Lord, I just thank you in the name of Jesus for the purpose of this ministry and what this ministry is going to do, Father God. I thank you that this ministry is alive, God, and that we are not dead, Father God, and there is a work 
as a church for us to do, Father God. So I pray, Lord, that we would rise up, Father God, and that we would not shrink back, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Father God. Lord, uh, fill these seats, Lord, wherever we are, God. Fill them, Lord God. But even if it be your will, Lord God, that we're not busting out at the seams, Lord God, let us be that sidewalk ministry, Father God. Let us be that workplace uh, ministry, Father God. Let us be that grocery store ministry, Father God. And this be the hub that we all come back to, Father God, to be to refill, Lord God. I pray for our encouragement, Father God, for the leaders, Lord God, as their shoulders are heavy in this season, Lord God. I pray, Father God, that they would give their burdens to you, Lord God, and that you, they would take, Father God, your view, which is easy, Lord God. So I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our midst, Lord God. I thank you for this upcoming year, God, and I thank you for just all the miracle signs and wonders that we're going to see, Father God. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. I love it. I love your energy, Joanne. Thank you. It's just the, everybody energy. I don't mean to sing to nobody y'all, but I'm, I'm just, it's, I'm loving it. All right, so this part is where we break bread together. And uh, once again, remember who got us here um, as we partake in eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood. Um, we can do it together, so if you get your wafer, we eat our wafer. Can you open this for me? And I don't know what happened. I don't think you broke it. Can you read the word? Oh. Thank you. Oh man, even in that, I, just since I'm opening this, and I, I, I just felt the Holy Spirit say, like, this is yet another demonstration of just like, every, everybody has a job. I didn't know this morning I was, you know, being struggled with this, but my brother in Christ, he came over just pr prompted to help me to open this. I still ended up breaking the wrong one, but it was just still just like that thing of like, we never know how our presence um, will impact somebody's lives. And just as simple as like opening a communion cup, it's not, it's not simple as we think it is. So I just even just say that and point that out to just remember like, man, we all have a purpose in this plan and what God is doing in this season. So don't ever count the little things that you do for people as something small and something insignificant because you just do not know how significant a smile, a high, an open of a communion cup can be and make somebody feel like loved, appreciated, and even seen and heard. Um, so let's, uh, let's close this communion out with just, God, we thank you for like going on that cross for us, Father God. Um, you knew our behaviors that we would demonstrate, Father God, even after your sacrifice, but yet and still, you decided to do this thing, Lord God, that some of us wouldn't even think of doing, Father God. Um, some of us, like, uh, we don't care, I don't know, maybe our kids will make us do it, but some of us, even our kids, we might not even be up there. But Lord, you did it for us in demonstration of your love, God, so I pray that as we are out here on these streets, Father God, that we would demonstrate that same love, God, um, with the, the minimal sacrifice of, of our lives, Father God. Um, so in Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Like, you know what, I got this 
set aside for this. And it could be like time, like, you know what, I wanna give my time because I'm tired, I'm working, I don't wanna do this, blah, 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 we know this feel. Sometimes we don't wanna give our money because we're just like, you know what, I have this money set aside for this and this and that. But what can, like, what, there, there's no, like, price we can put on being a part of building, like, uh, whatever it is that God is trying to do in this season. So, y'all have said, we need your money. Uh, we need your time. And so, we asking that you would sacrifice and challenge yourself a little bit on this morning, a little bit even more than you usually would, and give us your money, give us your time, give us whatever it is that God is prompting you to give. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesse would like the students to um, join him for uh, their time. Um, so if you're, if you're a student here, go see Jesse, follow him out. Uh, he would like to spend the morning with you. <clears throat> um, the rest of you, um, I'm a bit frazzled right now, um, out of sorts because of the technical issues that I've been trying to deal with this morning. Um, so if you guys just take a moment to pray for me um, while I, uh, God uh, helps me collect myself uh, to share the message, I could go ahead and say, well, Porsche already preached it, so um, there's no re for, reason for me to continue, uh, but, you know, I prepared this, I gotta, I gotta share it. So if you guys just take a moment to pray for me, um, if someone, someone would like to voice that uh, out loud, um, I'd appreciate that. <clears throat> sometime in the spring of this, this year that Jordan approached me and asked me if I was going to be at her uh, homecoming, or not her homecoming, her prom celebration. And 
you know, I've, I've, I've been at, or I, I've seldom been asked to prom send-offs in 25 years, 26 years of being here. Um, I think this is only the third one, and one of them is my own son. Um, that actually, or it was, it was his girlfriend that asked us to come, and Timothy said, don't come. Um, and so she asked, and then the following week she asked again, and the following week she asked again, and the following week she asked again. You get the, you get the pattern that's going on here? It wasn't until that third or fourth week that I began to realize something about our relationship. It wasn't until that third or fourth week that I began to get an idea of the impact that somehow I have had on Jordan. I don't know how I've had it. I don't know where it started. I don't know how it's grown. But last week even Portia said something about how much you won't understand how much the Brock family um, appreciates you and loves you for your ministry. Sometimes we get those things where it lets us know of the influence that we have on others. I want you to take a moment to share with one another that first time that you realized the influence that you had on another person, whether it was for good or for bad, but that one, that, that very first time that you realized what I'm doing is making a difference in someone else's life. Go ahead and share that with one another quickly. Just, uh, just, just that. Uh, I'll give you a minute or two minutes. One, of you, one minute for each of you to share each way. One more minute. For me, that day was, Blair and I were walking, I think probably, or Krista was probably in a stroller. Jonathan, or Timothy, was with us. And um, today, is, by the way, is Timothy and Tiara's uh, anniversary. Um, I think it's the 8th and 10th anniversary. Um, and uh, so with, with him, it was, it, him and I were walking, um, or I, I was walking, and I was walking, and we we're, were in a parking lot, and I was walking on the, the parking stops. Um, and I hear Blair next to me saying, Steve, Steve, pointing behind me, Steve, look, look, look. And I turn around, and Timothy is doing exactly as I'm doing. 
including the trying to get from one parking thing over to the next. He's following my example. And that became really for me that moment that I really began to realize that what I am doing is imprinting something on someone else's life. To this day, everyone who knows Timothy and knows him well says he acts like his dad in a lot of different ways. We have an opportunity to let our lives impact and affect or infect one another. Last week as we saw, um, as we began this message here, we, we saw that the congregation in order for us to take the next step are going to have to rediscover the step that happened way back when at the beginning of the foundation of the mission of the church, of making disciples. But how do you go about that? How does one become a citizen of the kingdom? And how does one grow as a citizen of the kingdom? It's not like in America where you can enroll in a citizen education course and take that course through guidance and then after you graduated from the course you can go and take your citizenship, citizenship exam and then you did to stand with several others, I pledge allegiance to the flag, whatever the constitution or whatever they do at that point. It's not like we have that, do we? Actually, in essence, we sort of do. Actually, if we look at it, the Gospel of Matthew was written as a citizenship training course. It was written for the follower, for the first century believers to have a course to say, okay, what is this thing that we believe? How do we live it out? How do we continue to follow Jesus? What does that look like? And building on the life of Jesus, he takes actually <clears throat> the life of Moses and reflects that Jesus is the second Moses. And here is what he's calling us to do. Here's the citizen kingdom that he's inviting us towards. And so over the next several weeks, what we're going to do is look at some, look at some things through the Gospel of Matthew from, verse, from chapter 4 to chapter 10 as we chart out what is our next step? What is the thing that we need to do next in order to develop an environment where disciples can be built? It begins... Or as, as we do that, what we're going to do is we have, we have a, a formula. C plus S plus T equals D. And over the next four weeks, what I'm going to do is each week I'm going to emphasize one of those letters. And as I emphasize those letters, we're going to fill out that formula to see what, what, what step or what process needs to be present in order for disciples to be made. Okay? So if you're ready, C is for cat, carnivals, curtains. No, C is for connect. Connect. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is entering into his ministry. He has done his 40 days in the wilderness, or he's been baptized his 40 days in the wilderness, being tempted by the devil. He comes back, he begins to launch his ministry. And in verse 18, it says, While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him, and going out from there he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called to them. Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. 
And then in Mark chapter 3, it's verse 13, it says that he went up on the mountain and called to him those who he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve whose names, who he, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. Why don't you notice what Jesus did there? Jesus created a small group. There were thousands who were following Jesus, but Jesus understood that a Sunday morning gathering of thousands doesn't really change lives. A Sunday morning gathering of thousands may be a place where I raise emotions, I do some instruction, I communicate content, but it's not the place where lives are really transformed because lives are really transformed in the context of relationships. And he calls out 12 disciples, first two sets of brothers, and then in Matthew it ends up that, that, that calling of the 12 is announced in Matthew chapter 10. And he calls them aside and says, of all of these thousands of people who are following me, following me, I want to spend time with you so that you can be with me. And in the context of being with me, I will be able to reach further into your lives to make a difference. You see, it's about connection. It's about Jesus calling those four, Matthew, or, uh, Peter and Andrew, James and John, and then the other eight additional, Matthew, as he calls them from the tax collector's booth in chapter 8 or 9, he calls them together and says, let's spend life together. And for three years, they do small group. They share lives. They see, they hear, they let their vulnerabilities hang out, especially Peter. I mean, Peter lets it all hang out, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But they spend time together, and as they spend time together with one another, community is built, relationships are built, lives are transformed. But here's what happens. You see, in the, in the context of this discipleship demands following. You see, Jesus invited them, come and follow me. And what the following means is I'm walking in the steps of, it was what Timothy was doing with me as a child. That as I'm stepping forward, you are walking in my steps. Have you ever been out in the snow? When there's a big, when there's the big snow, and you have somebody has trudged through the snow before you, and what you attempt to do is insert your foot in the, the spots where they were. That's the idea that's in essence here, and the idea of following that you're placing your steps in the footprints of Jesus. He's saying, come and follow me. Let your feet fall where mine have fallen. You follow after me. You do as I did. You let things that I have done impact you so they become common nature for you. It's the whole idea of script where it tells us in scripture that the whole, the, the, the culmination of Jesus' desire in us is that Jesus would be reproduced in us that we would become Christ-like. Follow me. Now, we've used that term more of, you know, I follow a certain baseball team, I follow certain musicians, I, I, I've got an interest in, I, I keep up on, lately I've, been, lately I've been keeping up on a search for 700 that this week was accomplished as Albert Pujols hit his 700th home run, and I'm glad that he was finally back with the Cardinals to do that. But we talk about following in those terms, having some interest in. 
Jesus isn't interested in us being interested in him. Jesus is interested in us being transformed into his likeness, not just following the information, but following him. How are we to follow him? How, how do we do that? Because, you know, it's, it's, you know it's, it's not like Jesus has left footprints in the snow or even footprints in the sand. It's not that Jesus has set out and said, okay, just step where I step. We can't, you know, we're, none of us are living in, Ju in Judea. None of us are living in Palestine or Israel. We can't walk in the liberal steps of Jesus. And if we did, it doesn't matter. That's not the point. The point is, are you following my example? Actually, that's... How do we know what the example of Jesus is? Well, the only way we know the example of Jesus is it's told to us in Scripture. Actually, the Gospel of John in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, John tells us that I have written all these things. There's a lot. Jesus did a whole lot more. If all the, if all of the, if everything that Jesus had done had been written down of the largest library, which was Alexandria at the time, so Harold Washington Library couldn't hold all the things that Jesus had done. But these are written that you would know that he is God's son and you would have life. You see, scripture has been given to us so that we can know what Jesus is like. And knowing what Jesus is like, we can follow after him. I'm going to talk more about that next week. But we also follow Jesus by following the example of someone who is following Christ. Paul said to the Corinthians, follow my example as I imitate Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Well, here's the problem with that is that often we're not close enough to one another to know the example that, we, that each of us are setting for each other. Our lives become so distant and disconnected, we become that Sunday morning gathering of people where all we get to see is when we've all dressed up for Sunday morning and put on our best behavior and our best attitudes and presented ourselves in the best manner, and we don't really know what's going on. And Jesus says, you got to follow. And so one of, for one of us, some of us, the, the thing is, is we're going to follow Jesus. We need to get involved in each other's lives enough that we know what, what Jesus looks like. Because the best, one of the best ways that we have of finding out what Jesus looks like is to look in the lives of each other and follow each other to the extent that we are following Christ. Now, what does what's that mean? Don't look at each other for the foolproof, perfect example of what it means to be a Christian because all of us fail at some level. Take those things which give us a positive example, discard those things which, which are examples of something other than Christ's likeness, but let each other build in your lives. You see, discipleship demands following, that we're following after him. Are you following someone? Are you letting someone get close enough to you that they can speak in your life, that you can see what's going on in them? Are you getting close enough that you can see beyond the dress up, the Sunday morning dress up? That you can see what Jesus is really like because you've been in their lives. You've experienced difficulty with them. You've heard their words and seen their actions. Are, are you living a life that is worth 
imitate him? Are you living a life that someone can say, I can know what Jesus is like because I've observed them. I've seen what they're like. I know what Jesus would do because I've seen this person do it. Are you seeking to live that kind of life that others can look at you and say, I know what God is like. I know what Jesus is like because I've seen the lives of his followers and his followers show me that he is unlike what the world, rest of the world is saying that Christians are like. Howard Hendricks, just this week, this came up, I think last week, came up in a conversation. We were talking together with one, I was talking together with somebody, and this book came up as Iron Sharpens Iron. And in that book, Howard Hendricks says that we all need three relationships. We all need a Paul who is pouring into our lives. That's the one who we can look at and say, that's what Jesus is like. We need a Barnabas, somebody who is about our age, that, that we would really consider a friend of ours, who doesn't respect us enough to say, well, I can't be honest with them. But that person who's going to be blatant, clear, and forthright, and speak directly into our lives, and walk with us through life. And we also need a Timothy, somebody younger than us spiritually who we are pouring our lives into. We all need to be following and we all need to have followers in order for disciples to be made. But having to, but following though requires proximity. You see Jesus called in Mark, in Mark chapter 3, I, uh, I like the way it says it, he called them to be with him. To be with him. To spend time. To share lives. To observe. To hear. To struggle. To cry. To laugh. Together with one another. To be with one another to the extent of, I know, you know what's going on. You're, you're the prop that you've closed the gap. How do we stick close to Jesus? How do we move into his realm? Are you close enough? You see, we're not one of the, the, the proximity. You've got to be close enough to somebody in order for yourself to rub off or for them to rub off on you. You've got to close the gap. You see, that's, that, that's why I think Sunday morning worship give, can give us a strong sense of identity and a wrong sense of calling that we come together, we worship together, and we think we've done God a favor by doing our worship time with Him, and we really haven't done the stuff that Jesus is really calling to become His disciple, because disciple demands more than sitting and singing together and hearing a message and going our way. Discipleship and following require proximity. It means moving closer to. You see, in Acts chapter 2, it says that the disciples began to or continue to meet together in the temple courts. We can say that's the large Sunday gathering, but house to house. And one of the things that it continues to do is that it emphasizes that the house to house stuff was happening on a daily basis. You see, they were closing the gap. Our lives are no longer isolated. We can no longer show each other the Sunday morning portrait because we know what the person's really like. We've closed the gap. We've sat on each other's couches. We've spent time together with one another. We've eaten with one another. We've gotten close. But lest we think that I'm talking about we just 
got close enough to hold hands, and we got close enough to hug one another, we were in the same room with one another, and in case you're beginning to think, well, proximity just means we've got to be gathered together. As long as we're gathered together, then it's okay. You see, proximity includes intimacy. It isn't just that you have your bodies in the same place, but, but discipleship having proximity and the proximity includes intimacy within our lives with one another, that our lives are so intermeshed with one another that we can say, I understand. I may never have been there. It may never have been an experience that I've gone through before. It may totally knock me off kilter, but I say, I understand what you're going through. It may not be my experience, but I know how that could hurt. I know, you know, earlier I announced that it was Timothy and Tara's anniversary, and you all celebrated that with me. Sometimes we aren't close enough to one another to know what things we need to celebrate. Well, we print anniversaries and birthdays in the newsletter monthly. But we really don't know what's going on in each other's lives. We've not moved in to each other's space. You see, that's in John chapter 1 verse 14 when it says that Jesus came and tabernacled or built his tent, pitched his tent or dwelt among us the issue that is being addressed there is that Jesus became intimately engaged in our lives and we see him over the chapters in the book of Mark or book of Matthew engaging in the lives of people, closing the gap. Getting involved in the life of a Roman centurion. Allowing a woman with a hemorrhage to touch his garments. Taking the hand of a young girl who had passed away in order to bring her back to life. But Jesus doesn't stand back and say, I don't really want you to get to know me. Because if you get to know me, you may not like me. That's something that some of us struggle with, isn't it? That we don't experience discipleship. We really don't experience the growth that, we, that God desires for us because we, have, we feel like we've got to wear a mask around one another. We've got to hide from one another. And as we hide from one another, we are in essence are hiding from God because we're not allowing each other's influence to reach into our lives. You gotta get close enough that the tears fall on each other's shoulders. That the laughs become contagious. Is there intimacy? When you're, in, when you're in an environment with others in the faith, do you tend to build a wall, to reserve things, to hold back? And because you hold back, you don't experience the richness. It's possible. You see, it's in, it's, it's in the context of relationships and small groups that we grow as disciples. Jesus had his group. They were with, they called them to be with him, them the night that he, everything was going apart. Everything was falling to pieces. And Jesus says, I want you guys. And he pulls three of them out and says, I want you to pray for me. And if Jesus can be that vulnerable, if Jesus can relate with that kind of intimacy, He calls us to do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John had been before the Sanhedrin, undergone some 
questioning from the same Hebrew. Put on the spot, told, you guys don't ever speak in the name of Jesus again. And one of the things it tells us about that encounter was that they recognized that these men had been with Jesus. You see, Jesus in that three years had so imprinted himself in their lives that people could tell. That's what Jesus wants from us. Let me be imprinted so deeply in your life that the world will look at you and their assessment of you is you've spent time with Jesus. You've let him reach down into the recesses of your life and transform you to make you different, to, to alter how you look at things. Is it apparent to the people around you that you have been with Jesus? And let me remind you at that point that it's not just being with Jesus, but being with his bride, his body, that results in the same kind of transformation. And God calls us to connect with one another. He calls us to move out of our isolation, to connect with one another, because in connecting with one another, in being relationally connected with one another, you will experience the transformation that I have for you. It's interesting, again, back in Acts chapter 2, it talks about them meeting from house to house and sharing, breaking bread and doing those things. And, the, and, and immediately on that, the whole thing ends with, and, the God, and God added to their number daily. I don't think it's incidental. I don't think that's a passing phrase that we should just overlook. But as the disciples grew as disciples, as they entered into life in the kingdom, as they began to share their lives with one another, serving one another, sitting with one another, breaking bread with one another, letting their lives bleed into each other, the result was the church grew. I wonder how much of the church not growing in our century is because we have isolated ourselves from one another. We've lost our connection and we've tried to do it alone. If we are going to become disciples of Jesus, if we're going to answer the call that Jesus has of going and making disciples, the first step that we need to take is that we need to connect. We need our lives to be intermeshed with one another for the unity of Christ to be demonstrated in our relationships with one another. For when one weeps, the other weeps. And when one celebrates, the other celebrates. That our lives are woven together in a fabric of unity that says we are family. And in that family, we'll serve the king. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you for giving us an example in Jesus of one who shows us that you are not a distant God, unconnected and uncaring about your creation. We thank you that in the life of Jesus, you show us one who walks in the places that we walk, has experienced the things that we experience, has cried over things that we cry about and laughed over things that will make us giggle. 
God, we pray that we would see in him on the Father. And we would exhibit that as well. That we would live lives that reflect who Jesus is. And we would engage one another so closely that we can see what Jesus is like through the eyes of each other. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said. He is risen. <laughs> got a couple. I've got a prayer concern and a few announcements. But if there's any others, let me know. Charlotte asked that we pray for her granddaughter, Ebony Barnes, for her employment. Any other prayer requests today? Okay. Yeah, my, uh, my brother, wife, sister passed away in the freezer with the big family. Kenny's, Kenny's brother's wife's sister passed away. Okay. Passed away. Pray for the big family. First, I'm praying for the big family for the whole prayers for a follow-up evaluation she's having at work tomorrow for the outcome of that. She didn't even 
tell me. I didn't know. Anybody else? Let's pray over these things, and then I'll share some announcements. Father God, we just come before your throne humbly and in awe of you, Father. It is, it is such a just awesome thing that we can come and talk to the creator of the universe about the things that are in our hearts. And we know that you love us enough because of the way you gave your son, that you love us enough to care for the things that matter to us and that are in our hearts. So Father, we bring these things before you that we've mentioned. That I pray for Beverly Barnes, Charlotte's granddaughter, that you would lead her to the right employment that would be good for her. I pray for Kenny's brother's wife, sister's family, that, uh, that you would just bring peace in that grief. And we pray also for Dorothy's friends, uh, that you would bring peace in their grief when they're still mourning their mom and their father's passed away. And, and for Dorothy as well, and, and her mentor being uh, gone now, and I pray that you would lead her to someone else who could be in that role for her. Uh, Father, we pray for the evaluation that Sean is facing, and just pray that it would be uh, positive and uh, constructive for her uh, in that process, and it would help her to improve her career, and her abilities, and her work. Pray for Tess's friend, Father Maria, that you would help the neurologist or whatever doctor she needs to understand what's happening and be able to give her the right treatment. And we pray that you would bring healing to her father. And we thank you for the opportunities that, for employment that Joanne has brought and for Sam hoping to bring friends. And I pray that your blessing would be over them as they're starting there and that that would be um, a good experience for them and, and positive career development. And, and just thank you for those opportunities that we hear. Lord, be with us as, as we go today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a couple other announcements. Um, so, Joanna, are you still connecting people if, if anyone else is interested in what you shared last week? Oh, we are going to the peak season and we need them and they can come and we So that was, that was working at UPS. So she's, if, if you know anybody, you can point them at Joanne. For that, um, Kenny shared with me that CTA is hiring next Saturday, that you have to register on their site ahead of time. And then in person, uh, October 1st from 9 to 12.30 at the CTA headquarters in Lincoln Clinton for drivers and mechanics, right? And they're hiring full-time. They're hiring full-time on the spot. So, so they have to register in advance and then go in person? Right. Okay. The fee is twenty four dollars to thirty eight dollars. Thirty twenty four dollars starting to thirty to thirty eight dollars now. Starting at twenty four up to thirty an hour. Okay, so good opportunities there. Um, and don't forget the things we're doing. You know, Steve talked about connecting. Um, we have connection groups that we do at one o'clock on Zoom um, today. Uh, we have the Wednesday Bible study at ten thirty, Thursday at seven PM. And daily prayer groups, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, at 7.30 and at 8. Be involved in these things. You know, this is not the only way to be involved with each other's lives, the things that Steve was talking about. But these are the ways that we do formally for you to, to be connected. And we encourage you to do that. Um, next week, we're going to have a, 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 another update on the congregational status, the building, the transition plans. Uh, and, time of dialogue about that after service, so uh, come back for that next Sunday. Um, I think we're going to continue the 9 o'clock, at least for the next few more weeks, on uh, the worship time. Um, we're still kind of evaluating what the schedule is going to be on Sunday with connection groups, so we're going to stick with this for at least a few more weeks. Uh, I don't know, are there any other announcements that we need to... All right. You know, I was thinking of this verse earlier and even while Steve was speaking today and I think it kind of fits um, walking in the footsteps of Jesus and that's the fruit of the Spirit. 
The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. If we're walking in the footsteps of Jesus, those are the things people should see when we're filled with the Spirit. So I pray for that for us this week. Father, just be with us this week. Fill us with your Spirit. And I pray that that fruit will grow in us. And anything that's not of that fruit will wither. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.